The Dawn Flows Home to the Sea, Part 1, by Mikhail Sholokhov, Continued. He arrived at the staff headquarters at the very moment when Kudinov, the commander, was questioning a messenger from Hapyersk district. Kudinov was sitting huddled in a chair behind his table, twisting the end of his belt in his hands. And what do you yourself think about it? he demanded. Well, of course, the Cossack hesitated. What can I say? I think like the rest. And you know what the people are like? They're afraid. They want to rise, but they're afraid. They want to, but they're afraid, Kudinov shouted angrily, turning pale and fidgeting in his chair as though the seat were hot. You're like a lot of girls. You want to and you don't want to, and your mama won't let you. Well, go back to your district and tell your elders that we shan't send a single troop into it so long as you don't begin yourselves. You can hang your reds one by one. A stocky, black-whiskered man in a sheepskin jacket entered the room without knocking. He greeted Kudinov with a nod and sat down at the table, resting his cheek on his palm. Grigor, who knew all the staff by sight, did not recognize him and stared at the fine outlines of the face, the swarthy but not sunburnt complexion, the soft whiteness of his hands. Indicating the newcomer with his eyes, Kudinov said to Grigor, Melyakov, this is comrade Georgidze. He's... He paused, twisted the Caucasian silver buckle on his belt, and turned to the messenger. Well, you can go. We've got work on hand. Go back home and tell whoever sent you what I've said. The Cossack rose from his chair. The flaming, ruddy brown fox skin of his cap almost touched the ceiling. I'm sorry if that's the case, he said, taking his cap off. But you needn't shout at me, Your Excellency. I've brought you the message of our elders, and I shall tell them your answer. But you needn't shout. First the whites shouted at us, then the reds, and now you're starting. Ah, our life is hard, hard these days. He furiously clapped his fur cap back on his head, bundled himself out into the corridor, and closed the door quietly behind him. But once he was outside, his anger got the better of him, and he slammed the outer door so violently that the plaster fell from the ceiling. The people are a fine lot these days, Kudinov remarked with a smile when the man had gone. In the spring of 1917, I was driving to the district center, and it was plowing time, just about Easter. The free Cossacks were plowing and had gone quite mad with their freedom, and they were plowing all over the road as though they hadn't enough land already. I called to one Cossack who was plowing up the road, and he came over to me. Hey, you, what are you plowing up the road for, I asked him. He got alarmed and replied, I won't do it any more. I'll smooth it down again. I frightened two or three more in the same way, but a little farther on I found the road plowed up again and saw the man who had done it with his plow. I called to him, Hey, come here. He came up to me. Who the hell gave you the right to plow up the road, I shouted. He stared at me, a strong-looking little Cossack he was too, and his eyes glittered. Then he turned without a word and ran to his bullocks. He picks up an iron bar and runs back, seizes the side of my tarantas and puts his foot on the step. Who are you, he shouts, and how long will you go on sucking our blood? For two pins I'd make a hole in your head for you. And he raises the bar. I said to him, now, Ivan, I was only joking. But he replies, I'm not Ivan now, but Ivan Osipovich. And if you can't talk to me properly, I'll smash your face in. And so with this Cossack just now. He whines and bows and snivels, and then at the end he shows his real character. The people are puffed up with pride. It's the blackguard in them that comes to the top and not pride. Blackguardism has acquired the status of legality, the Caucasian officer said, and without waiting to be contradicted, closed the subject. Please let me begin the conference. I should like to get back to my regiment today. Kudinov turned to Grigor. You stay here, he said. We'll confer together. You know the proverb, two heads are better than one. By a stroke of luck for us, comrade Georgidze happened to be left behind in Vyshenska district, and he'll be able to help us. He's a lieutenant colonel, and he's been through a staff training college. How did you manage to get left behind in Vyshenska, Grigor asked Georgidze, for some unaccountable reason, turning inwardly cold and cautious. I came down with typhus. I was left behind in Dudorovsky when the retreat began on the northern front. 
What regiment were you in? I wasn't in the front line. I was attached to the staff. Gregor wanted to question him further, but the frowning expression on the Caucasian's face made him feel the unwisdom of continuing the examination, and he broke off in the middle of a sentence. A minute or two later, the chief of staff, Safonov, and the commanders of the 4th Cossack Division and the 6th Special Brigade entered, and the conference began. Kudinov briefly informed them of the situation at the front. The Caucasian was the first to speak. He slowly opened up a map on the table and spoke fluently and confidently. To begin with, I think it's absolutely necessary to throw certain reserves of the 3rd and 4th Division into the sector held by Myelyakov's division and the Special Brigade. According to the information we have and from examination of the prisoners, it's absolutely clear that the Red Command is preparing a serious attack on this particular sector. We've learned that they're sending two cavalry regiments, five special detachments, three batteries and machine guns to correspond. At a rough estimate, this adds 5,500 men to their forces. In that case, they will undoubtedly have the numerical superiority, not to mention their ascendancy in equipment. The yellow sun streamed into the room from the south. A blue cloud of tobacco smoke hung motionless under the ceiling, and somewhere in it a fly, poisoned by the smoke, buzzed desperately. Sleepy after two nights of vigil, Grigor drowsily stared out of the window. His eyelids felt as heavy as lead, and the warmth of the overheated room combined with his weariness to drug his will and his consciousness. Outside the window, the low spring breezes were dancing, the last snow was glittering rosily on the hillsides, and the poplars beyond the dawn were swaying so strongly in the wind that as he watched them, he thought he could hear their incessant bass whispering. The Caucasian's clear and insistent voice aroused his attention. He forced himself to listen, and imperceptibly his drowsiness passed. The weakened activity of the enemy on the front held by the 1st Division, and his determined efforts to advance on the migulinsk mieszkov line warn us to be on our guard. I suggest, he stumbled over the word comrades, and fiercely gesticulating raised his voice, I suggest that Kudinov and Safonov are committing a serious error in taking the red maneuvers at their face value and proposing that the sector held by Myelyakov should be weakened. It is the ABC of strategy to draw off your enemy's strength in order to fling your own forces against the weakened sector. But Myelyakov doesn't need the reserve regiments, Kudinov interrupted. On the contrary, we must have reserves to our hand in order to close the gap in the event of their breaking through. It appears Kudinov has no intention of asking me whether I shall hand over my reserves or not, Grigor remarked with rising anger, but I shan't give them up, not a single squadron. Why, brother, that's... Safonov began, smiling and stroking his whiskers. Brothers got nothing to do with it. I won't hand them over, and that's all I've got to say. I am responsible for my sector and for my men, Grigor retorted. The dispute thus suddenly arisen was ended by Georgidze. With his red pencil, he pointed out the threatened part of the front on the map. And when the heads bent close together over it, it was clear to them all that any attack being prepared by the Red Command was indeed only possible on the southern sector, as it was closest to the dawn and most advantageous in regard to communications. The conference was over within an hour. The moody Kondrat Medvedev, commander of the 4th Division, who had been silent throughout the discussion, said at the end, distrustfully looking around him, We can send reserves to Melyakov's support. We've got men to spare. But one thing is bothering me. Supposing they attack us on all sectors at once, then what shall we do? They'll drive us into a bunch, and we shall be in a serious position, like snakes caught on a little island. Snakes can swim but we've got nowhere we can swim to, one of the others laughed. We've thought of that, Kudinov said thoughtfully, but if that situation arises, we must leave behind all those unable to bear arms, leave our families too, and fight our way through to the Donets. We're not a small force. There are 30,000 of us. And the cadets will take us up. They've got scores to settle with the upper Don Cossacks. 
The hen is sitting, but where are the eggs? There's no point in talking like that. Gregor put on his cap and went out. As he closed the door, he heard Georgidze reply, The Vyshenska Cossacks and the insurgent forces will redeem their guilt to the dawn and to Russia if they fight manfully against the Bolsheviks. So he says, but he's smiling to himself, the serpent, Gregor thought. Again, as at the first moment of his meeting with this officer, he felt an inward anxiety and causeless anger. At the gate he was overtaken by Kudinov. They walked along together for a minute or two without speaking. The wind was ruffling the puddles on the dung-littered square. Evening was drawing on. Round and heavy white clouds were slowly floating like swans from the south. Vital and scented was the moist smell of the melted earth. Under the fences the grass was showing green, and now Gregor could indeed hear the groaning suff of the poplars beyond the dawn. The ice will be breaking soon, Kudinov remarked. Yes, damn it, we shall die without even the luxury of a smoke. A tumbler of self-sown tobacco costs forty Kerensky rubles now. Tell me, Gregor turned as he walked and sharply demanded, that officer from the Circassians, what is he doing here? You mean Georgidze? He's chief of the operations department. He's a brainy devil. It's he who draws up all the plans. He beats the whole lot of us at strategy. Is he always stationed in Vyshenska? No, we've assigned him to the baggage train of the Chernovsky regiment. Then how does he manage to keep in touch with events? He's always riding into Vyshenska almost every day. Why don't you keep him here? Grigor asked, endeavoring to get to the bottom of the matter. Kudinov coughed and covered his mouth with his hand. He answered reluctantly, It's not advisable in front of the Cossacks. You know what they're like. They'd say the officers have got into the saddle again and are making us take their line. Are there any more like him in our forces? Two or three in Kazanska. But don't you fret yourself. I know what you're thinking. But, my boy, there's nowhere we can go to except to the cadets. Isn't that so? Or are you thinking of setting up your own little republic of ten districts? No, we'll have to go with hanging heads to Krasnov. Don't condemn us, Pyotr Mikhailovich Krasnov, we must say. We went a little wrong in deserting the front. Went wrong? Gregor interrupted. Well, didn't we? Kudinov answered in sincere surprise. I've got the idea. Gregor flushed and smiled forcedly. I think we went wrong when we began the rising. Kudinov was silent, staring curiously at Gregor. They parted at a crossroad beyond the square. Kudinov went on to his quarters, and Grigor returned to the staff and told his orderly to bring the horses. As, slowly disengaging the reins, he rode off, he was still trying to understand the reason for his feeling of hostility to the Caucasian. Abruptly, his mind cleared as he thought, what if the cadets have purposely left these clever officers with us in order to stir up revolt in the rear of the Reds and to guide us along their own way. His memory brought evidence to the support of this conclusion. He wouldn't say what regiment he was from. He said he was attached to the staff, but no staff passed this way. And what devil carried him to Dudorovsky, into that lonely little village? Oh, it's clear we've got ourselves into a fine mess. The educated people have tied us up. The lords have got us into their net. They've hobbled our lives and are using us to do their work. You can't trust anyone in the least thing. Once they had crossed the dawn, he put his horse into its fastest canter. Behind him, his orderly, a good soldier and brave Cossack, creaked in his saddle. Such were the men Grigor selected to follow him through fire and water. With such men, tried in the German war, he surrounded himself. The orderly, formerly a scout, was silent all the way, smoking even in the wind, and while cantering. As they dropped down into a village, he advised Gregor, If there isn't any need for hurry, let's spend the night on the road. The horses are tired out, and it will rest them. They halted for the night in a village. After the freezing wind of the steppe, the crumbling hut built of wattles was homely, comfortable, and warm. The earthen floor stank saltily of calf and goat piddle, and the stove smelt of soggy, burnt bread baked on cabbage leaves. Grigor replied reluctantly to the old Cossack woman's questionings. She had seen three sons, as well as her husband, join the rising. 
She had a deep, masculine voice, and almost her first words were to tell Grigor roughly, You may be an officer and commander of the Cossack fools, but you've got no power over me, an old woman, old enough to be your mother. Talk to me, won't you? You sit yawning and yawning. I suppose you don't want to talk to a woman. I've sent three sons to your war, and the old man too, for his sins. You command my sons, but I gave birth to them, suckled them, brought them up, carried them in my skirt, and it wasn't easy either. Don't turn your nose up, but tell me, will there be peace soon? Soon. You ought to be in bed, old lady. Soon. But how soon? Don't you try to put me to bed. I'm the mistress here, not you. I've got to go out to see to the goats and lambs. We bring them in out of the yard at night. They're still young. Will there be peace by Easter? When we drive out the reds, we'll make peace with them. You don't mean to say. The old woman dropped her hands with swollen wrists and fingers crooked with work and rheumatism onto her bony knees and bitterly chewed her withered brown lips. Have they given in, then? What are you fighting them for? The people have gone stark staring mad. You think it's a game to shoot with your firearms and to look handsome on your horses? But what of us mothers? It's our sons that are being killed, isn't it? And aren't we our mother's sons, you bitch? Gregor's orderly said angrily, completely losing his temper with the old woman's talk. They're killing us, and you talk of our looking handsome on our horses. You've lived till you're gray-haired, but you go on babbling away and won't let anyone sleep. Sleep! Sleep, you plaguey fool! What have you put your spoke in for? You sit there as silent as a well and then suddenly break out like that? The old woman retorted. There'll be no sleep for us with her tongue, Grigor Pantelievich, the orderly groaned in despair. Lighting a cigarette, he struck the flint so hard that a pyrotechnic display of sparks flew from it. You're as nagging as an aching tooth, woman. I should think your old man would be only too glad if a bullet does get him. Glory be, he'll say, I'm free of the old woman. Gregor compelled them to make peace. As he dropped off to sleep on the floor, he heard the door slam, and his legs felt a cold draft. Then a lamb bleated sharply right by his ear. The tiny hoofs of the goats clattered over the floor, and his nostrils caught the fresh and joyous smell of sheep's milk, the frost, and the scent of the cattle yard. He woke up about midnight and lay with open eyes, in the stove, the coals were gleaming rustily beneath the opal ash. The lambs lay huddled together around the stove, and in the pleasant midnight silence he could hear them sleepily grinding their teeth and occasionally snorting. A distant full moon stared through the window. In its yellow square of light, a restless little black kid was kicking and jumping about the floor, raising a pearly dust. The hut was illumined by a yellowish-blue light almost as bright as day. A piece of looking-glass sparkled on the shelf of the stove, and in one corner the silver frame of an icon gleamed darkly and faintly. Grigor's thoughts turned again to the conference in Vyshenska, the messenger from the Khopiersk district, and the Caucasian lieutenant colonel. At the memory of him, his original unpleasant, oppressed anxiety returned. The kid walked over his sheepskin and stared long and stupidly at his belly, then, growing bold, parted its legs. A fine stream fell on the outstretched palm of the orderly sleeping at Gregor's side. The man groaned, awoke, rubbed his hand on his trousers, and shook his head bitterly. He's wet me, damn him! Get away! He struck the animal on the head. Bleating piercingly, the kid jumped off the sheepskin, then went to Gregor and licked his hand with its rough little tongue. Chapter 9 After their flight from Tatarsk, Stokman, Koshevoy, Ivan Alexievich, and several Cossacks who had been serving as militiamen attached themselves to the Red 4th Zaamursky Regiment. But late in March, hearing that in ust Karpiersk, a company was being formed of communists and Soviet workers who had fled before the insurgents. Stokman, Ivan, and Mishka went to join it. They hired a sledge and were driven by a Cossack old believer with such a childishly rosy and clean face emerging from his great beard that even Stokman's lips twisted into a smile as he looked at him. Mishka hummed a song to himself all the way. 
Ivan Alexeyevich sat in the back of the sledge with his rifle on his knee, and Stockmann fell into conversation with their driver. There's nothing wrong with your health, comrade, he remarked. The old man, overflowing with health and strength, smiled warmly. No, God be praised, and why should there be? I've never smoked, I drink water instead of vodka, and I eat good wheat bread, so why should I ever be ill? And have you been in the army? For a little while, the cadets took me. Why didn't you go with them to the Donets? You ask strange questions, comrade. He dropped the woven horsehair reins, removed his glove, and wiped his mouth, frowning as though offended. Why should I have gone there? I wouldn't have served with them if they hadn't made me. Your government is just, though you've gone a little wrong. How? Stockman rolled a cigarette and lit it, but still had to wait for an answer. What are you burning that weed for? the Cossack said at last. Look how the spring is coming all around, and you soil it with your stinking smoke. I'll tell you how you've gone wrong. You've squeezed the Cossacks, oppressed them. There are a lot of fools among you, otherwise you wouldn't have suffered. How have we oppressed them? You know as well as I do. You've shot people. Today it's one man's turn, tomorrow another's. And who's going to wait for his turn to come? Even a bullock will shake its head if you go to cut its throat. There's Bukhanovsky village over there, for instance. You see the church where I'm pointing with my whip? Well, there was a commissar there. Did he deal justly with the people? I'll tell you. He rounded up old men out of the village, took them into the brushwood, parted their souls from their bodies, and wouldn't even let their families bury them. And all their crime was that at some time or other they had been elected honorary judges. And do you know what sort of judges they were? One of them could only just sign his name. Another stuck his fingers in the ink pot or made a cross. Their only crime was that they had long beards and forgot to button up their flies because they were so old. They were just like children. And this commissar settled other men's lives as if he was God. One day an old man was going across the square with a bridle to get his mare, and some urchins called after him as a joke. Here, the commissar is coming for you. The old man crossed himself with his heretical cross. They're all new believers there, and took his cap off before ever he went into the house. He went in all shaking and asked, Did you want me? And the commissar says, No, nobody wanted you, but as you've come, you'll get the same as the others. Take him outside, comrades. Well, naturally, they took him and put him up against a wall. His old woman waited and waited, but he never came back. He'd gone. This commissar sees another old man from a different village in the street and calls to him, Where are you from? What's your name? Then he snorts, You've got a beard like a fox's tail. You're too much like the dead Tsar Nikolai. We'll make soap of you. Take him away, he orders his men. They shot him only because he'd got a long beard and happened to be seen by the commissar at a bad moment. And isn't that doing shame to the people? Mishka had stopped humming as soon as the man began his story, and at the end he said angrily, Your lies aren't very good ones, Daddy. You tell better ones. Before you say it's lies, find out the truth. Then you can talk. And do you know all this for certain? The people were all talking about it. The people. The people say you can milk chickens, but they haven't any teats. You've been listening to lies, and your tongue wags like a woman's. The old men were peaceable. Peaceable, Mishka jeered. Your peaceable old men probably helped to stir up the rising. Your judges may have had machine guns buried in their yards. And you say they were shot for their beards or for a joke. Why didn't they shoot you? Your beard's as long as an old goat's. I sell my goods at the price I've paid for them. Who knows? The people may have been lying. They may have done some harm to the new government, the old man muttered disconcertedly. He jumped out of the basket sledge and strode along in the melting snow at the roadside. The sun shone graciously over the steppe. The gleaming azure sky held the distant interlacing of hills and valleys in a mighty embrace. The scented breath of the approaching spring was faintly perceptible in the rustling breeze. 
To the east, beyond the white zigzag of the Donside Hills, through a lilac haze, arose the summit of the hill above ust Khapyetsk. Fringing the horizon, the white fleecy clouds stretched over the earth in a great billowing pall. My grandfather, the old man began again, he's still alive and a hundred and eight years old, they say. And his grandfather told him that during his lifetime, that is, my great-great-grandfather's, a prince was sent by Tsar Peter into our upper dawn, Dlina Rukov, or Dolga Rukov, his name was. And this prince came down from Varanyezh with soldiers and destroyed the Cossack settlements because they didn't want to accept Patriarch Nikon's accursed faith and serve the Tsar. They caught the Cossacks, slit their noses and hanged some of them, and sent them floating on barges down the dawn. What are you telling us all this for? Mishka asked sternly. Why, I expect even if he was Prince Dlina Rukov, the Tsar never gave him any such rights, and the Commissar in Bukhanovsky was like that too. I'll give you something to remember me by for ages, he shouted in the assembly at Bukhanovsky. But was he given any such right by the Soviet government? That's the point. He never had any orders to do such things. On Stockmann's temples, the skin gathered into puckers. I've listened to you, he said. Now you listen to me. Maybe in my ignorance I've said something which wasn't true. If so, you must excuse me, the man muttered. Wait, wait. What you said about the commissar certainly didn't sound like the truth, but I'll find out. And if it was so, if he did treat the Cossacks like that, we shan't ask him what he thinks of it. But when the front reached your village, did the red soldiers shoot a comrade of their regiment because he'd stolen from some Cossack woman? That's what I heard in your village. That's true. He robbed a woman of a chest. That's right, it did happen. And it's true they shot him. We argued afterwards where he ought to be buried. Some said in the cemetery, but others said he would desecrate the spot, and so he was buried by the threshing floor where they had shot him. So there was such a case, Stockman swiftly rolled a cigarette. Yes, yes, I don't deny it, the man willingly agreed. Then don't you think we shall punish the commissar if we find he was guilty of what you said? But, dear comrade, maybe there's no one over him. That other man was a soldier, but a commissar. The inquiry will be all the more strict, understand? The Soviet government settles only with its enemies and we shall ruthlessly punish any representatives of our government who unjustly oppress the toiling people. The silence of the March noonday step, broken only by the whistle of the sledge runners and the sound of the horses' hoofs, was suddenly shattered by the roar of cannon. The battery at Krutovsky village had renewed its bombardment of the left bank of the dawn. The conversation in the sledge died away. They turned onto the Hetman's road, and the spacious lands beyond the dawn, speckled with patches of snow melting on the yellow sands, with capes and blue-gray sweeps of willow and pine woods came into view. At ust Hapyersk, the driver reined in his horses outside the house of the Revolutionary Committee. Stockman rummaged in his pocket, pulled out a Kerensky 40-ruble note, and handed it to the driver. The man broke into a smile, revealing his yellow teeth under his damp whiskers, and hesitated in embarrassment. Why, comrade, for the love of Christ, it wasn't worth all that. Take it for your horse's labor, and don't you have any doubts of the government? Remember, we stand for the government of the workers and peasants. It's our enemies that have driven you on to the rising. The kulaks, the ottomans, and officers, they are the main cause of the rising, and if any of our men have unjustly offended a toiling Cossack who is sympathetic to us and helping the revolution, we shall find ways of settling with him. You know the saying, comrade, God's high in his heaven, and it's far to the Tsar. It's a long way to your Tsar, too. Don't struggle with the strong, don't go to judgment with the rich. And you're strong and rich. You're throwing your forty rubles away. Five would have been a good price. But thank you, all the same. He gave you that for your talk, Mishka Koshevoy smiled and smacked his trouser legs. Yes, and for that fine beard of yours. 
Do you know whom you have been driving, you old blockhead? A red general. Ho. Oh. Yes, you can say ho. Oh. You're like all the rest, damn you. Give you little and you'd go crying round the district. I drove comrades and they gave me only five rubles. You'd have felt sore about it for twelve months after. And when we give you more, you roar to heaven how rich they are. Threw away forty rubles. He couldn't count his money, he had so much. Well, goodbye, Longbeard. A red guard came galloping out of the yard where the Moscow regimental staff was quartered. Where's that sledge from, he shouted, reining in his horse. What do you want to know for, Stokman asked. We want ammunition carried to Krotovsky. Well, you can't have this sledge, comrade. And who are you? The red guard, a handsome youngster, rode up to Stokman. We're from the Zaamursky regiment. Don't requisition this sledge. All right, he can go. Drive off, old man. On inquiry, Stockman learned that a partisan company was being organized not in ust but in Bukhanovsky. It was being recruited by the same commissar of whom the old believer had spoken on the road. The communists and Soviet workers from Yelansk, Bukhanovsky, and other districts, supplemented by Red Army men, had come together to form quite an imposing fighting unit of two hundred bayonets with several dozen swords and a mounted patrol. The company was temporarily at Bukhanovsky and, together with a company of the Moscow regiment, was holding up the insurgents attempting to advance from the upper reaches of the rivers Yelansk and Zimovna. After a talk with the chief of staff of the Moscow regiment, Stokman decided to remain in ust and join the second battalion of the regiment. He had a long talk with the political commissar. You see, comrade, the yellow-faced commissar said unhurriedly, the situation here is rather complicated. My lads are mostly Moscow and Ryazan men, with a few from Nizhny Novgorod. They're hefty fellows, chiefly workers. You stay with us. There's plenty of work for you to do. We must work among the population and educate them. You know what the Cossacks are like. You've got to keep a sharp ear open. You needn't tell me that, Stokman replied, smiling at the man's patronizing tones. But tell me, who is this commissar in Bukhanovsky? The man stroked the gray brush of his short mustache and replied languidly, raising his bluish transparent eyelids. He's a good fellow, but he doesn't properly understand the political situation. He's evacuating all the male population of the district into the heart of Russia now. Next morning, the 2nd Battalion was called to arms, and within the hour it was marching in column formation towards Krutovsky village. A mounted patrol was sent from Krutovsky across the Don, and the column followed it. The ice of the river was pitted with spongy blue holes. Behind them, the battery on the hill was firing in the direction of the poplar clumps, visible beyond Yelansk village. The battalion was under orders to pass the village of Yelansk, which had been evacuated by the Cossacks, and to march on through the district, joining forces with the 1st Battalion advancing from Bukhanovsky. The shells flew high over the heads of the column, and their explosions shook the ground a little distance ahead. Behind the column, the ice of the dawn was cracking and breaking. Ivan Alexievich, marching in the same rank as Stockman and Mishka, glanced back. The water's coming down, it looks like, he remarked. Stupid business to cross the dawn at such a time. Look, the ice is breaking, Mishka snorted, stumbling as he marched over the plowed land. Stockman gazed at the backs of the men marching in front of him, at the rhythmic swaying of the rifle barrels with their smoky blue bayonets. Looking around him, he observed the calm and serious faces of the soldiers, the swinging movement of the gray caps with their five-pointed stars, the gray greatcoats going yellow with age. He heard the heavy tread of the many feet, and his nose caught the smell of damp boots, tobacco, and leather straps. He half-closed his eyes, and feeling a great influx of warmth towards all these fellows whom yesterday he had not even met, he wondered, it's good to feel it, but why have they suddenly become so near and dear to me? There's the common idea moving us, of course, but there's more in it than that. There's the common task, 
and perhaps the nearness of danger and death. His eyes smiled, surely not because of the nearness of death. He stared with almost a fatherly feeling at the broad back of the man marching in front of him, at the strip of clean red neck showing between the collar and the cap, then turned his eyes to his neighbor. The man was clean-shaven, with swarthy, blood-red cheeks, and a fine, firm mouth. He was tall but well-built and marched almost without swinging his arm. A painful frown furrowed his forehead. Stockmann drew him into conversation. Been in the army long, comrade? he asked. The man's light brown eyes ran over Stockmann coldly and interrogatively. Since 1915, he replied through his teeth. The restrained answer did not freeze Stockmann off. Where are you from, he asked. I'm from Moscow. A worker? Uh Uh-huh. Stockmann glanced at the man's hands and noticed marks betraying an iron worker. A metal worker? The brown eyes again passed over Stockman's face. I'm a metal turner. Were you too? And the stern eyes gleamed warmly. I was a locksmith. But why do you keep your eyes screwed up? My boots are rubbing. They've gone hard with the wet. It isn't because you're afraid, Stockman smiled inscrutably. Afraid of what? Well, we're going into battle. I'm a communist. And aren't communists afraid of death? Mishka joined in the conversation. After a moment's reflection, the man replied, You're still fresh to such matters, that's clear, brother. I mustn't be afraid. I've given myself orders, understand? I know what we're fighting for and whom we're fighting, and I know we shall win, and that's all that matters. Smiling at some memory and glancing at Stockman, he related, Last year I was in a detachment in the Ukraine. We were being pressed hard all the time. We had to leave our wounded behind. We received orders that someone was to break through the white lines at night and get to their rear to blow up a bridge over a river so as to stop an armored train from passing. Volunteers were called for, but there weren't any. The communists among us, there were only a few, suggested we should cast dice to see who should go. But I thought it over and volunteered. I took a slow fuse and matches, said goodbye to my comrades, and went. The night was dark and misty. After going two hundred yards, I crawled through uncut rye and then along a gully. As I crawled out of the gully, I remember a bird went fluttering up right under my nose. I crawled past the white guard some twenty yards away and got to the bridge. A machine gun detachment was defending it. I lay there a couple of hours waiting for the right moment, then set the train and began to strike the matches in the open. But they were damp with the dew and wouldn't burn, for they'd been in my breast pocket and I'd had to crawl on my belly. Then I did get frightened. Dawn would be breaking soon, and my hand trembled and the sweat poured into my eyes. It's all up, I thought. No explosion but a shooting party, I thought. I tried and tried and finally got a match to light and set fire to the fuse. I hid myself among a pile of sleepers on the embankment. When the explosion came, there was a fine to-do. Two machine guns began to rattle away, and horsemen galloped right past me, but they'd have had a job to find me at night. I got away from the sleepers into the corn, and only then, do you know, All the strength went out of my hands and legs, and I couldn't move. I lay down. I'd made my way to the bridge bravely, easily, but it was another thing to get back. I was like a bit of chewed rag. Of course, I got back at last, and the next morning I was telling the boys about my bad luck with the matches, and one of them asked, But what about your cigarette lighter? Had you lost it? I felt in my pocket, and there it had been all the time. I fished it out, and it worked first time. Scattering snow over Ivan Alexeyevich as he marched silently along on the outside file, a couple of sledges with machine guns galloped past. One of the gunners fell out of the second sledge, 
and a roar of laughter went up from the Red Army men as the driver cursed and pulled up his horses violently for the gunner to jump back into the sledge. Chapter 10 The first division of the insurgent forces made Kargin the center of their resistance to the Reds. Grigor Myelyakov fully realized the strategic value of the position around Kargin and resolved not to yield it in any circumstances. Hills stretched along the left bank of the river Chira, and from their commanding heights the Cossacks could defend their lines splendidly. Below, on the farther side of the Chira, lay Kargin, and beyond it the steppe stretched for many miles to the south, intersected here and there with ravines and gullies. Gregor himself selected the position for his three-gun battery, not far from a mound covered with oaks which dominated the district and constituted a magnificent observation point. Every day saw a battle around Kargin. The Reds usually attacked from two directions, from the steppe on the south and along the Chira from the east. The Cossack lines stretched some two hundred yards beyond the little town. The fire of the Reds almost always forced them to retreat through Kargin and up the steep bottoms of narrow gullies into the hills. The Dawn Flows Home to the Sea, Part 1, by Mikhail Sholokhov, continued. The fire of the Reds almost always forced them to retreat through Kargin and up the steep bottoms of narrow gullies into the hills. But the Reds were not strong enough to drive them farther. Their advance was greatly hampered by the lack of cavalry, which could have outflanked the Cossacks and forced them into further retreat, and the infantry, irresolutely marking time outside the town, would have been set free for further operations. The infantry could not be employed for such a maneuver, for at any moment the Cossack cavalry could have swooped down on the marching soldiers and broken them up. The insurgents also had the advantage of knowing the district perfectly, and they lost no opportunity of dispatching cavalry unperceived along the ravines to attack the enemy flank and rear, continually threatening the Reds and paralyzing their further movement. Gregor drew up a plan to shatter the enemy. The Cossacks were to retreat, make a feint, and draw the Reds into Kargin, while a cavalry regiment executed a flanking movement through the valleys to attack them from the rear. The plan was worked out to the last detail. At a conference on the previous evening, the commanders of the various detachments received exact instructions. Everything was as simple as ABC. After carefully checking every possibility, everything that might unexpectedly hinder the realization of the plan, Gregor drank two glasses of homemade vodka and, without undressing, threw himself on the bed, covered his head with his greatcoat, and slept like the dead. The Reds occupied Kargin next morning. Part of the Cossack infantry fled through the streets into the hills in order to draw them on. The Red soldiers slowly spread through the little town. Standing on a mound close to a battery, Gregor watched the Red infantry occupy Kargin and gather near the river Chira. It had been agreed that at the first shot from the battery, the two companies of Cossacks lying in the orchards under the hills should pass to the attack, while the flanking regiment was to attack from the rear. The commander of the battery wanted to fire his first shell at a machine-gun sledge, swiftly galloping down into Kargin. But at that moment the observer reported that a force of Reds was advancing from the east over a bridge some three miles away. Fire at them with the mortar gun, Gregor advised, not removing his eyes from his field glasses. The gunner swiftly sighted the gun, and the mortar roared heavily, plowing up the ground behind it in its recoil. The very first shell hit the end of the bridge just as the second gun of a red battery was driving onto it. The shell swept the horses away, and they learned afterwards that of the team of six only one was left unscathed. Through his glasses, Gregor saw a yellow-gray column of smoke arise in front of the gun. 
The horses reared as they were enveloped in the smoke, and the men fell and fled. A mounted soldier near the limber was lifted together with his horse, and they were carried bodily off the bridge, falling onto the ice. The gunners had not expected to achieve such a success with the first shot. For a moment there was silence around the Cossack mortar, and only the observer shouted something and waved his arms as he stood on the mound a little way off. At the same moment a faint hurrah rose from the dense undergrowth of the cherry orchards and gardens below. There was the crack of rifle shots. Throwing caution to the winds, Gregor ran up the mound. The reds were fleeing through the streets. He heard a disorganized roar of voices, sharp shouts of commands, the rattle of shots. One of the red machine gun sledges began to gallop up a slope, but almost at once, not far from the cemetery, it turned sharply and opened fire over the heads of the reds at the Cossacks pouring out of the orchards. In vain did Grigor scan the horizon for signs of the Cossack cavalry. They were still not to be seen. The reds on the left flank were running towards the bridge connecting Kargin with the adjacent village of Akhipov, while their right flank was still pouring down through Kargin, dropping under the fire of the Cossacks who held the two streets close to the river Chira. At last the first squadron of cavalry appeared round the hills, then the second, the third, the fourth. They deployed into line and swept sharply to the left to cut off the fleeing crowds of red soldiers. Crushing his gloves in his hand, Grigor impatiently followed the course of the struggle. The Cossack cavalry swiftly approached the main road, and the reds turned and fled back in ones and twos and little groups towards the village of Arkhipov. There they met the fire of the Cossack infantry, and turned once more and ran back to the road. The Cossack cavalry wheeled round to face Kargin, and swept the reds away like leaves before the wind. Close to a bridge, some thirty of the enemy were cut off without hope of escape, and they began to defend themselves. They had a machine gun and large reserves of belts. Hardly had the Cossack infantry emerged from the orchards when the machine gun began to work at a feverish speed, and the Cossacks dropped, crawling under the shelter of sheds and stone fences. From Grigor's post of observation, he saw his Cossacks dragging a machine gun through Kargin. By one of the yards on the outskirts they hesitated, then ran inside it. A few minutes later, their machine gun began to stutter from the roof of the granary. Through his glasses, Grigor saw the gunners grouped with outflung legs behind the shield. One was lying on the roof, another was clambering up a ladder with ammunition belts wound round him. The Cossack battery opened fire in support of the infantry, concentrating its aim on the groups of reds. Within fifteen minutes, the red machine gun by the bridge suddenly lapsed into silence. A faint hurrah arose, and the figures of mounted Cossacks appeared and disappeared among the bare trunks of the willows. It was all over. By Gregor's order, the inhabitants of Kargin and Arkhipov dragged the 147 dead Red Army soldiers into a shallow trench which was dug just outside the village. The Cossacks captured six two-wheeled ammunition carts with horses, a damaged machine gun, and forty-two baggage wagons with stores. The Cossacks lost four dead, and fifteen were wounded. After the battle, there was a week's respite from fighting on the Kargin front. The Red Command threw forces against the Second Insurgent Division, and forcing it back, soon captured a number of villages in the Migulinsk district. Every morning the sound of distant gunfire was to be heard in Kargin, but reports on the course of the struggle arrived only tardily, and they failed to give any clear idea of the situation. During those days, in an attempt to rid himself of the somber thoughts possessing him, Grigor took to drinking heavily. The insurgents were suffering a severe shortage of flour, and frequently the Cossacks had to eat boiled wheat, as the mills could not cope with the army's needs. But as there were enormous stocks of grain, there was no shortage of homemade vodka, and it was poured out in a steady stream. Instances of men going drunk into battle were frequent. 
On one occasion, an entire squadron of Cossack cavalry rode half-drunk into the attack, galloped straight up against a machine gun, and was almost completely wiped out. Grigor was kept amply supplied with vodka for his orderly, Prokhor Zikhov, distinguished himself in capturing the liquor. After the battle of Kargin, at Grigor's request, he brought in three pitchers of vodka and called for singers, and Grigor, feeling a joyous freedom from restraint and seeking oblivion from his thoughts, drank with the Cossacks until daybreak. Next evening, he again called for singers, and again delighted in the roar of voices and human merrymaking, all that created the illusion of real enjoyment and veiled the unpleasant reality. The craving for drink quickly developed into a habit with him. As he sat at the table in the morning, he already felt an invincible desire for vodka. He drank much, but never too much. He always remained steady on his feet. Even when the others were drunkenly sleeping under the tables and on the floor, covering themselves with their greatcoats, he still seemed to be sober, though his face was pale and his eyes fixed, and he frequently pressed his hands to his head. After four days of incessant carousing, he began to show signs of its effects. He went baggy and blue beneath the eyes, and his glance was senselessly stern. On the fifth day, Prokhor Zikov suggested with a promising smile, Come with me this evening to a fine woman I know at Lichovidov. She's handsome, but you mustn't be bored at first. I know she's as sweet as a watermelon, though I haven't tried her, but she's sharp, the devil, and wild. You won't get what you want from her the first time you ask, but you won't find a better hand at making vodka. She's got the finest vodka in all the Chira villages. Her husband's retreated beyond the Donets, and she thinks he must be dead. They rode to Lichovidov that evening. Grigor was accompanied by two of his commanders, Ryabchikov and Yermakov, by armless Alexei Shamil, and the commander of the 3rd Division, Medvedev, who was on a visit to the 1st Division. Prokhor Zikhov rode in front. Arrived in the village, he turned down a side street and opened a little gate leading into a threshing floor. For some five minutes they followed him past straw and hay ricks, then through a bare cherry orchard. The golden chalice of the crescent moon stood in the dark blue heaven. The stars twinkled, and a magical silence lay all around, save for the howl of a distant dog and the sound of their horses' hoofs. A yellow point of light glimmered against the dark background of the sky, and the silhouette of a large, reed-roofed hut appeared. Bending from his saddle, Prokhor opened a creaking wicket gate. At the steps, Grigor jumped from his horse, wound the reins around the balustrade, and entered the porch. Groping for the door latch, he opened the door and passed into a spacious kitchen. A young, stocky, but well-built Cossack woman with swarthy face and black, well-shaped brows was standing with her back to the stove, knitting a stocking. On the stove, a girl, perhaps nine years old, was sleeping with one arm flung out. Without removing his outdoor clothes, Grigor sat down at the table. Have you got any vodka, he asked. Don't you think you might say good evening first, the woman replied, not glancing at Grigor and not stopping her knitting. Good evening, if you feel like that. Have you got any vodka? She raised her eyebrows, smiled at him with her black eyes, and listened to the sound of steps in the porch. I've got some vodka. But there are a lot of you come to spend the night, aren't there? Yes, a whole division. The other Cossacks crowded through the doorway. One of them rattled out a rapid dance rhythm with a couple of wooden spoons. They piled their greatcoats in a heap on the bed and laid their weapons on the benches. Prokhor hurried to help the woman set the table. Armless Alexei went into the cellar to get some pickled cabbage, fell down the steps, and came up carrying the fragments of the broken plate and a pile of wet cabbage in his greatcoat. By midnight they had drunk two pails of vodka and had eaten incalculable quantities of cabbage. 
Then they decided to kill a sheep. Prochor groped for one in the sheep pen, and with one stroke of his sword, Yermakov cut off his head. The woman lit the fire and set a pot of mutton on to cook. Once more the sound of the wooden spoons rattling out a dance rhythm was heard, and Vyabchikov danced around, kicking out his legs, smacking his shanks with his hands, and singing in a sharp but pleasant tenor voice. I smell blood, Yermakov suddenly roared, testing his sword blade on the window frame. Grigor, who liked Yermakov for his exceptional bravery and Cossack frenzy, restrained him, knocking on the table with his copper mug. Khalampi, don't be a fool, he shouted. Yermakov obediently thrust his sword back into its scabbard and thirstily seized a glass of vodka. With such comrades, death has no terrors, Armless Alexei said, sitting down at Grigor's side. Grigor Pantelievich, you're the pride of our hearth. You're the only man in all the world we swear by. Shall we have another drink together? Only when dawn was at hand did Grigor begin to feel that he was getting drunk. As though they were a long way off, he heard the other men speaking. He heavily opened his bloodshot eyes and, with an intense exercise of willpower, kept his senses. The gold epaulets are ruling us again. They've got the government into their hands, Yermakov roared, embracing Grigor. What epaulets? Grigor asked, pushing his hands away. In Vyshenska. Do you mean to say you haven't heard? A Caucasian prince is in control there. A colonel. I'll kill him. Melyakov, I lay my life at your feet. Don't desert us. The Cossacks are murmuring. Lead us to Vyshenska, and we'll kill them all and burn the place down. We'll kill Kudinov. The colonel, everybody, we've got enough men to settle with them. Let's fight both the Reds and the cadets. That's what I want. We'll kill the colonel. He stayed behind on purpose. Khalampi, we must bow our knees to the Soviet government. We are in the wrong. Vyagor suddenly recovered his senses for a minute or two and smiled wryly. I'm only joking. Drink up, Yermakov. What are you joking about, Melyakov? Don't joke, this is a serious matter, Medvedev said sternly. We want to overthrow our government. We'll send them all packing and put you in their place. I've talked with the Cossacks, and they've agreed. We'll tell Kudinov and his band, clear out, we don't like you. If they go, well and good, but if not, we'll send a regiment to Vyshenska and sweep them away, damn them. No more of that talk, Grigor roared furiously. Medvedev shrugged his shoulders, left the table, and ceased to drink. Vyabchikov struck up a song. The shadows outside were turning lilac when the woman led Grigor into the front room. You've given him enough to drink. Now stop it, you devils. Can't you see he's good for nothing, she said to the others, holding up Grigor with one hand, with the other pushing away Yermakov, who was following them with a mug of vodka. Don't you lie down with him now. You won't get anything out of it, Yermakov winked, swaying and spilling the vodka from the mug. That's nothing to do with you. You're not my father, she retorted. She pushed Grigor into the room, put him on the bed, and with loathing and pity in her eyes, sat watching his deathly pale face with its unwinking, staring gaze. She fingered and stroked his hair until he fell asleep. Then she made her own bed on the stove at her daughter's side. But Shamil would not let her sleep. With his head on his arms, he snorted like a startled horse, then suddenly awoke and hoarsely roared a snatch of song. Once more he dropped his head on his arms, slept for a few minutes, then again burst into song. When Grigor awoke next morning, he recollected Yermakov and Medvedev's words. He had not been completely fuddled with drink, and without much difficulty he recalled their talk about overthrowing the government, seeing at once that the drinking bout at Likhovidov had been organized with the deliberate object of winning his support for the plan. The leftward-minded Cossacks, who were secretly dreaming of complete separation from the rest of the Don province, and of forming their own miniature Soviet government without the communists, were intriguing against Kudinov. 
who had openly expressed his desire to retreat to the Donets and join forces with the White Army. They did not realize all the disastrous results of strife inside the insurgents' camp, when at any moment the Red Forces might sweep them away together with their dissensions. A child's game, Gregor thought as he lightly jumped off the bed. When he was dressed, he called Yermakov and Medvedev into the room and closed the door fast behind them. Now listen, brothers, he said. Get yesterday's talk right out of your heads, and no grumbling, or it will be the worse for you. It isn't a question of who's in command. It's not a question of Kudinov or someone else, but of the fact that we're in a ring. We're like a barrel in its hoops. If not today, then tomorrow the hoops will crush us. We must march our regiments not towards Vyshenska, but on Migulinsk, on Krasnokutsk, he said emphatically, not turning his eyes from Medvedev's moody, passionate face. You think it over and realize that if we begin to get rid of our commanders and to organize mutinies, we're done for. We must go over either to the whites or to the reds. There's no middle way. One or the other will crush us. You won't go and tell others about our talk, Yermakov asked as he turned away. It will go no farther, but only on condition that you stop agitating among the Cossacks. What about Kudinov and his shadows? They've not got half the power that I have, so long as I'm in command of a division. They're a poor lot, I know, and they'll deliver us into the hands of the cadets if we let them. But where are we to go to, anyway? There's not a single road open to us. All the arteries are cut. That's true, Medvedev agreed, and for the first time since he had entered the room, he raised his eyes to Gregor's face. Two more days Grigor spent drinking in the villages, lying around Kargin, passing an empty life in drunken carousals. The smell of vodka even saturated his saddle. Women and girls who had lost their virgin flower passed through his hands, sharing with him their transient amours. But each morning, satiated with the amorous fevers of the latest delight, Grigor soberly and tranquilly thought, I've lived and experienced everything in my day. I've loved women and girls. I've trodden the step. I've rejoiced in fatherhood, and I've killed men, have gone myself to face death, and delighted in the blue sky. What new thing can life show me? Nothing. And I can die. It won't be so terrible. I can play at war without risk. I'm not rich, and my loss won't be great. A flood of memories poured through his mind as he lay at the latest woman's side. Old friends, old faces, former voices, scraps of conversation, laughter. His memory turned to contemplation of the beloved step, and suddenly, blindingly, it opened its expanse before him. He saw the summer cart road, a bullock wagon with his father sitting on the cross tree, the ploughed land and the golden brush of harvested grain, a black sprinkle of ravens on the road. As his mind wandered among memories of the irrevocable past, it stumbled against Aksinya. My love, my unforgettable love, he thought, and contemptuously shifted away from the woman sleeping at his side. Sighing, he impatiently awaited the dawn and hardly had the sun begun to tinge the east with hues of raspberry and gold when he jumped up, washed, and went to his horse. Chapter 11 Like an all-consuming step fire, the rising spread, but a steel ring of fronts surrounded the insubordinate districts. The shadow of destiny lay like a brand on men, the Cossacks were playing with death, and for many of them the coin to which they had called heads came down tails. The youngsters lived and loved violently. The older men drank vodka until they fell under their seats, played at cards for money and bullets, bullets being worth more than money, rode home for furloughs, so that if only for a minute they might set down their rifles and pick up the axe, might rest among their dear ones, 
might mend the fence or get the harrow or horse collar ready for the spring labor. Many who thus tasted the life of peace returned drunk to their regiments, and before they were sober again they went into the attack and marched straight up against the machine guns. Or, aflame with frenzy, not feeling the horses under them, they went savagely out on night raids, captured prisoners, and ruthlessly, with elemental savagery, worked their will on them, finishing them off with their swords. The spring of 1919 was brilliant with unprecedented beauty. The April days were fine and as translucent as glass. Over the inaccessible azure sweep of heaven, the flocks of wild geese and copper-tongued cranes floated, floated, overtaking the clouds, flying ever to the north. On the pallid green pall of the steppe close to the lakes, the settled swans sparkled like scattered pearls. The birds sang and called continually in the water meadows along the rivers. Over the flooded pools the geese called, preparing for flight and the osiers whistled incessantly with the amorous ecstasies of the drakes. The willows were green with catkins, the poplars blossomed with sticky-scented buds. The green-flushed steppe was drenched with inexpressible charm, flooded with the ancient scent of the bare black earth and the ever-young grass. The insurgents' war was peculiar in the respect that each Cossack was close to his native village, they grew tired of going on outpost duty and secret raids, tired of making their way over hills and down valleys on patrol duties, and they obtained permission from their company commander, rode home and sent their withered aged fathers or their adolescent sons out in their places. The squadrons always had a full complement of fighters, yet it was a continually changing complement. But some of the Cossacks were more cunning, as soon as sun was setting, they would gallop away from their squadron's night quarters, would cover some twenty or thirty miles, and were home soon after nightfall. They would spend the night with their wife or lover, would saddle their horses when the second cock crew, and before the Milky Way had faded in the sky, they were back with their squadron. Many of them could find no pleasure in war just outside their native yards, there's no point in dying, more than one said after frequent partings from his wife. The command was particularly afraid of mass desertion setting in when the spring field labor was due to begin. Kudinov made a special visit to each of the divisions, and with unwanted severity declared, Better that the winds should roam over our empty fields, better that we should not cast the grain over our earth, but I will not allow any Cossack to be given furlough. Anyone caught at home without leave will be cut down and shot. Gregor took an active part in one battle below Klimovsky. Towards noon of the April day, crossfire broke out around the yards at the end of the village, and a few minutes later the red lines were advancing towards the village. On the left flank, sailors, the crew of some vessel in the Baltic fleet, moved deliberately. With a fearless attack, they drove the Cossack squadrons out of the village and pushed them back along a valley. When the Reds began to get the upper hand, Grigor, who was watching the struggle from a hill, waved his glove to Prokhor Zikhov to bring him his horse. He jumped into his saddle and at a swift trot rode down to a valley where he had stationed a squadron of cavalry in reserve. Through the orchards and over the fences he made his way to the squadron, and found the Cossacks dismounted and at ease. When still a little way off, he drew his sword and shouted, To horse! In a moment, the two hundred Cossacks had mounted. The squadron commander rode forward to meet Grigor. Are we to attack? he asked. Yes, and high time, too. Grigor's eyes flashed. I'll lead the squadron myself. He turned to the men. In troop formation, as far as the other end of the village. Forward! Beyond the village, he ordered the squadron to form up in readiness to attack, tried whether his sword would slip easily from his scabbard, and riding some fifty yards in front of the squadron, led it at a gallop towards Klimovka. At the top of the rise, overlooking Klimovka, he reined in his horse for a moment and studied the position. Below him, the horse and foot-red soldiers were galloping and running in retreat. 
Cleogor half turned towards his squadron. Draw swords! Into the attack! Brothers, follow me! he shouted, drawing his sword and crying, Hurrah! He set his horse at a gallop towards the village. The tightly drawn reins quivered in his left hand. The sword raised above his head whistled through the wind. An enormous white cloud obscured the sun for a minute or two, and overtaking Gregor, a gray shadow slipped with apparent deliberation over the rise. He turned his eyes for a moment from the huts of Klimovka to the bright yellow joyous light fleeing somewhere before him. An inexplicable and unconscious desire to overtake the light speeding over the ground took possession of him. He struck his horse and put it into its fastest gallop, and after a few moments' desperate riding, the horse's outstretched head was lit up with a network of sunlight, and its ruddy hair suddenly gleamed brilliantly golden. At that very moment, a shot rang out from the street in front. The wind brought the sound of the explosion to his ears. Another second, and then, through the thunder of his horse's hoofs, through the whistle of bullets and the roaring of the wind past his ears, he ceased to hear the thunder of the squadron galloping behind him. It was as though the heavy roar of the mass of horses had fallen away from his ears, as though he were outdistancing it. The rattle of rifles sounded like dry brushwood on a campfire. The bullets whistled past. In perplexity and alarm he looked round, and anger and bewilderment distorted his face. The squadron had turned their horses and were galloping back, were abandoning him. A little way behind him, the commander was rising in his stirrups, awkwardly waving his sword and weeping and shouting in a hoarse, broken voice. Only two Cossacks were following Gregor, while Prokhor Zikhov had turned his horse and was galloping up to the squadron commander. The others were scattered and galloping back, thrusting their swords into their scabbards and plying their whips. For a brief second, Gregor reined in his horse, trying to discover what had happened behind him, why the squadron had suddenly taken to flight before a man had fallen. And in that moment he resolved he would not turn, would not flee, but would ride on. He saw seven red sailors bustling around a machine gun on a cart behind a fence some two hundred yards in front of him. The reds were attempting to swing the machine gun round to train on the Cossacks, but apparently in the narrow alley they could not manage it. The rifle bullets shrieked more fiercely about his ears. He turned his horse to come down into the alley from behind, across a fallen fence. He looked back from the fence to the gun, and now saw the sailors quite close to him, hurriedly unharnessing the horses. Two others were kneeling and firing at him from their rifles. As he galloped towards them, he could see their fingers feverishly working the triggers and heard the shots right against him. They were reloading the magazines, bringing the butts to their shoulders, and firing so swiftly that Gregor, streaming with sweat, felt joyously certain that they would not hit him. The fence crashed beneath his horse's hoofs and was left behind him. He raised his sword and fixed his eyes on the foremost sailor. One more spasm of fear scorched him like lightning. They'll be firing at point-blank range, right at the horse's chest, He'll throw me, and then I'm done. Two shots right at him, a shout. Take him alive! Before him he saw the ribbons of a sailor's cap with the tarnished gold of a ship's name on it. Gripping the stirrups with his feet, Gregor felt his sword sink into the sailor's soft body. The second sailor managed to send a bullet through the flesh of Gregor's left shoulder before he fell beneath Prokhor's sword, his head cloven in two. At the sound of a rifle magazine, Gregor turned. The little black eye of a rifle barrel was staring at him from behind the machine gun. He dodged the bullet which whistled past his head, flinging himself sideways with such force that the saddle shifted and the snorting, terrified horse swayed, then jumped across the center pole of the cart and cut down the man before he had time to reload his rifle. In the flash of a moment he had sabered four sailors, and, not listening to Zikov's shouts, would have galloped in pursuit after a fifth running round the corner of the alley, but the squadron commander galloped in front of him and seized his horse by the snaffles. Where are you going? They'll kill you. They've got another machine gun behind the shed there. 
Two more Cossacks and Prokhor, who had dismounted, ran to him and pulled him forcibly from his horse. He struggled in their hands, shouting, Let me go, you snakes! I'll kill them! All of them! Grigor Pantelievich, Comrade Milyakov, come to your senses! Prokhor pleaded with him. Let me go, brothers, he asked in a different, fading voice. They released him. The squadron commander whispered to Prokhor, Put him on his horse and lead him back. I think he's ill. He was about to go to his own horse, but Grigor threw his cap to the ground and stood swaying. Suddenly, grating his teeth, his face contorted terribly, he groaned and began to tear open the fastenings of his great coat. Weeping and shaking with his weeping, he began to mouth like a dog at the snow under the fence. Then in a moment of horrible clarity of mind, he tried to get up, but he could not, and turning his tear-stained, distorted face to the Cossacks standing around him, he shouted in a broken, savage voice, Whom have I killed? For the first time in his life he writhed in a fit, shouting and spitting out foam from his lips. Brothers, there's no forgiveness for me. Kill me. Cut me down for the love of God. Death. Put me to death. The commander and a troop officer ran to him and threw themselves on him, tearing off his sword belt and field pack, closing his mouth and holding down his legs. But he struggled under their weight for a long time, scattering the snow with his convulsively kicking legs and beating his head against the bare hoof-marked earth the earth on which he had been born and had lived, taking full measure from life, rich both in bitterness and in petty joys. The grass grows on the earth, indifferently accepting the sun and the rain, feeding on its life-giving juices, humbly bowing beneath the destructive breath of the storm, and then, scattering its seeds to the wind, it dies as indifferently, with the rustle of its withering blades welcoming the radiant death of the autumnal sun. The following day, Grigor handed over the command of the division to one of his regimental commanders, and accompanied by Prokhor Zikhov, rode off to Vyshenska. Beyond Kargin, they saw a large flock of wild geese settled on a pond lying in a deep valley. Prokhor pointed to them with his whip and laughed. It would be fine to shoot a goose, Grigor Pantelievich, and then to have a drink of vodka. We'll ride closer, and I'll try my hand at a shot, Grigor said. They dropped down into the valley. Prokhor halted with the horses on the brow of the hill while Grigor removed his greatcoat, set the safety catch on his rifle, and crawled down a narrow gully overgrown with last year's scrub. He crawled for a long time, hardly raising his head, crawled as though reconnoitering an enemy outpost, as he had when he had captured the German sentry on the Stochod River. His faded khaki shirt blended with the green-brown hue of the ground. The gully concealed him from the sharp eyes of the sentry gander, standing on one leg at the waterside. He crawled under until he could get a good shot, then raised himself a little. The gander turned its gray, snaky neck and watched him anxiously. On the water the geese were floating, diving, and paddling. The quiet sound of their chatter and the splash of water came to his ears. I can take aim through the fixed sight, he thought, his heart beating as he lifted the rifle to his shoulder and fired at the gander. As soon as he had fired the shot he jumped to his feet, deafened by the beating of wings and the clutter of the geese. The gander at which he had aimed flew up but vainly tried to gain height. The others rose in a dense cloud above the pond. He fired twice more at the cloud of birds, watching whether any fell, then turned and despondently went back to Prokhor. Look! Look! Prokhor shouted to him, jumping into his saddle and standing upright on his horse, pointing with his whip to the geese distancing in the blue expanse. Grigor turned and trembled with gladness, with the agitation of the successful hunter. One goose had dropped behind the flock and was swiftly sinking, its wings flapping slowly and intermittently. Rising on tiptoe and putting his hand to his eyes, Grigor watched it. Suddenly the bird dropped like a stone, the sweep of its wings gleaming a dazzling white in the sunlight. Prokhor rode up to Grigor and threw him his horse's reins, 
and they both galloped along the slope. They found the goose lying with outstretched neck, its wings fluttering as though trying to embrace the unkind earth. Gregor bent down from his saddle and picked up the prize. Prochor tied it to his saddle bow, and they rode on. At Vyshenska, Gregor halted at the hut of an old Cossack acquaintance, asked him to cook the goose at once, and sent Prochor off for vodka. He made no attempt to report to the staff. They sat drinking until late in the afternoon. During the conversation, the old Cossack poured a stream of complaints into Gregor's ears. The officers here are carrying on in a fine way, Gregor Pantelievich, he began. What officers, Gregor asked. Our own officers, Kudinov and the others. What are they doing? They're squeezing all the foreigners. They're arresting the families of those who've gone off with the Reds. Arresting women, children, and old men. They've taken a relation of mine because of his son. But what's the point of that? Supposing you'd gone off with the cadets to the Donets and the Reds had arrested your father, Pantolyeman, that wouldn't have been fair, would it? Of course not. But our own government is arresting them. When the Reds came here, they did wrong to no one, but these have gone mad. There's no holding them in. Swaying a little, Gregor rose and reached for his greatcoat hanging on the bedpost. He was only slightly drunk. Prochor, he shouted, my sword and pistol. Where are you going, Grigor Pantelievich? That's not your business. Do as you're told. Grigor belted on his sword and revolver, fastened and belted his greatcoat, and went straight to the prison on the square. The sentry on duty at the gate barred his way and asked for his pass. Stand aside, I tell you. I can't let anyone in without a pass. Before Grigor had succeeded in pulling his sword half out of its scabbard, the sentry had fled through the door. With hand still on his sword hilt, Grigor followed him into the corridor. I want the commander of the prison, he shouted. His face was pale, his brows knitted. Some limping little Cossack came running to him. A clerk peeped out of the office. A moment later the commander appeared, sleepy and angry. You know that without a pass, he thundered, but recognizing Grigor and staring into his face, he stammered, so it's you, Comrade Melyakov. What do you want? The keys to the cells. To the cells? Well, have I got to say it a dozen times? Give me the keys, you cur. Grigor strode towards the man, and he fell back, but he replied firmly enough, I won't give you the keys. I have no right. Right? Grigor grated his teeth and drew his sword. In his hand it described a whistling circle under the low ceiling of the corridor. The clerk and the warder flew like frightened sparrows, and the commander pressed against the wall, his face whiter than the whitewash, and hissed through his teeth, There they are, but I shall make a complaint. <laughs>